This is the 19th season of Bass Talk Live. BTL is presented by Bass Cat Boats, Strike King Lures, Aftco, Pro Guide Batteries, X Zone Lures, Shoreline Boat and RV Repair, Spro, Gamakatsu, Big Bite Baits, The Bass Tank, Denali Rods, Beatdown Outdoors, and Sunline. BTL, coming at you. Good morning and welcome to another exciting edition of BTL Bass Talk Live. We are going to talk about bass fishing. We've got a very important derby going on over at our nation's capital. Uh, I kind of like the... It, it took me a second for it to figure out, but they're doing a Saturday, Sunday, Monday in the next to last uh, ta- uh, MLF Invitational uh, on the Potomac River. As I believe there's just one more left up in uh, Wisconsin after this to determine who goes on to the BPT. Uh, and looking at the standings, it looks like Nick Hatfield has a pretty commanding lead over there, about five pounds. Like I said, we're recording this at 8.30 in the morning, but day three started off. He's got 17. Uh, Andrew Loberg, one of the guys we've had on the show before, California dude who uh, who I'm really high on, have been really high on, has his stuff together, and I think is going to be in this sport for a long time. He's in second, uh, but watching that Angler of the Year race, obviously uh, BTL uh, regular guest, Matt Steffen, Logged, I think, like a 60th place finish there. He was sending me all the updated numbers and stats to see is he gonna what he's gonna have to do on his home body of water to get in. But I like it. Monday typically a high traffic day. Everybody's at work trying to get back in the swing of things. A lot of times you can't get on live during the weekend. I know Jeffries used to talk about this a lot, but having a weekday finish, uh, especially with the live and the quality uh, product that uh, MLF does with their uh, with their live, being able to watch it, I think you get some more eyeballs than you do when you're uh when you're cooking out especially with uh yesterday being father's day another tournament that had a lot of eyeballs on it particularly in the sooner state would be the fifth Bassmaster open eq tournament of the year on lake eufaula in oklahoma a lake that i have deemed probably one of the top five i think tournament lakes in the country not big bass lakes not numbers lakes but tournament lakes it was real interesting how this one's going to break down. I think we'll we'll I'll try to get Ben on next week, but I do have, and he is now the two-time Bassmaster Open champion, and he's going to be in the twenty twenty-four Bassmaster Classic. So two-time Bassmaster Classic qualifier, Joey Nania, and uh, dude, like the last. Well, I mean, you've always been really consistent, but the last like three or four years, man, you are uh, you're in the mix a lot. That has to feel good to know when you launch your boat that you got a shot to lift the lift the trophy and make Bassmaster Classics. I mean, honestly, like I didn't expect it at all. And uh, getting in like even this tournament, I'm going to a lake I've never been to before. Um, I just you know I've been doing this a long time now so you kind of game plan smarter you know you fish smarter not harder is kind of the way I've been looking at it Um, I don't over practice really I do my research of course leading up to it but there wasn't a whole lot of info on this lake and I was glad it was kind of a blank slate as far as the opens field goes where there wasn't a hundred guys or you know some tournaments there's been 150 of the guys in the field have fished there a bunch you know Mm -hmm. and so everyone kind of knows everything and so this one was an open slate and I have been very consistent lately, but to win two in, in three years, I mean, that's just so unexpected, you know? Uh, 52 pounds, eight ounces. And let's start at the beginning. One of the things that I thought was interesting going into this event was there wasn't a lot of of information on it outside of kind of the local knowledge, you know, with live now, uh, with tournament coverage, with the internet, there's so much you can watch. You can find all the good areas are pretty much well known. This year, we've gone to Ufala, Alabama. Everyone knows so much stuff about that. Uh, Toledo Bend. Everyone knows so much about Toledo Bend. Bugs Island was a little bit of a was a little bit of a wild card there. But then Wheeler Lake, so much information about that. But but what did you do going into Oklahoma? Or did you really just show up? Did you look at what MLF had done when they had been there in April when Kelly Jordan won? Like kind of what was your game plan going into it? One thing, you know, there wasn't many, there weren't many bass fishing videos on the lake. And I mm-hmm. looked at you a lot and you know i've got a youtube page and people look at my stuff if they're coming to logan martin or lay lake or you know any of the coosa river lakes to see 
how I catch them there. And uh, you can learn a lot from doing that. Now, if you watched a video on Bugs Island, it was hard. Or I mean, you follow Oklahoma. It was hard to find something that related to when we were there because the water level is up and down every year. I realized, you know, I always track the water level coming into it and the weather pattern. Um, I knew that there wasn't going to there weren't going to be many bushes in the water based on what I had read and seen and seeing what the water level was. And so I kind of thought I was going to get to flip some. But then to find out that even though the lake says it was at full pool, it still looked three feet down because of the rains the last several years. Um, so that kind of played into it. But I did my research and I had a game plan that really actually one other thing I learned a lot from watching a drone video from somebody that was a pleasure boater that had drone that lake on YouTube. It was really? like fly around. Yeah, it was like drone footage of Lake Eufaula. And I saw these big giant rocks and I saw clear water, like super clear water. And I'm like, man, that place is that clear on the bottom end. And so I just saw that and that kind of, you know, the clear water, I know the thermocline is normally deeper in clear water and the fish can go deeper. And so that was something I wanted to figure out that bottom part of the lake. Um, and I saw that that was where the clear water was and it was muddy in the other arms. You can see it in Google Earth images and stuff too. But I like fishing clear water if I can. Now I love flipping and stuff. I mean, I flipped a lot of fish at you fall or at a uh, Wheeler. Sorry, we've had so many tournaments. I it's know. hard to keep track. But um, yeah, so I just, I like fishing clear water and my game plan was to on this massive 105,000 acre lake I didn't want to make it fish big in my mind I've been to new bodies of water before and I've tried to run up one arm and go practice up in this river one day and go to another river another day and go down to the dam on this day and spent like five days in you know at least half the practice in different areas and then try to piece that all together in the tournament and try to make a game plan of which direction to turn when you launch and if you're trying to figure out which way to turn when you launch and on a lake you don't know, you're going to end up running and getting spun out more often than not. And making a 20-minute run when you don't know the lake that well to one place and that pattern doesn't work, then what do you do from there? So my game plan was to learn by the ramp and figure out the ramp area. Ramp areas are always good. And then I wanted to figure out down by the dam. And so then I wanted to fish between the ramp and the dam was my goal. And that's and that ended up being what I did. And it worked out perfect. That is a really good learning segment for those people who are are getting into tournament fishing, who are trying to figure out new bodies of water. Because, like it is, and, and I I I'm not a expert on Lake Eufaula by any means, but I've fished it for the last 15 years. I've I've caught them on both ends of the lake. I know guys who were out there. I did what you did. I spent a, a, what you said not to do. I spent a, a day in the muddy water up by the I-40 yeah. bridge. I spent a day in the muddy water by Crowder. I spent a day in the Mid Lake Basin in Longtown. I, I spent a day in Porum just to try to get a kind of a feel for it. I didn't even fish by the ramp because I know how that typically goes down yeah. there, but I have familiar with it. But that is really good because what you did was you took 105,000 acres and let's figure out what you what you turned it into. You identified productive areas that yep. suited your strengths, that you knew how to population a fish, and you took this 105,000 acres and you turned it into, let's say, uh, 500 acres outside of the ramp, mm -hmm. and you turned it into, let's say, 4,000 acres down there in that Porum Dam area. Is that a fair assessment, yep. would you say, about? Yeah. And then I also I did figure out Longtown Creek, too. Um, I got in Longtown. So I had Longtown right there. It, it was all within eight miles of each other. Like everywhere I would ever want to run was right yep. there in that section. And there were so many fish in that area. And so my first day of practice was Saturday. And I just like getting bites on my first day of practice. And so I started by the ramp and I pull up on a rock vein, you know, that stuck out off the bank. And I catch like a four and a half pounder on a square bill. And then I started running every rock vein I could find. And actually, I got on them on a Ned rig, which with a Ned rig with the little TRD bugs on it, like a little mm -hmm. mini crawd, the little mini beaver style Z-Man bait. And that thing looks more like a crawdad than any other, you know, small Ned rig bait I've ever seen. It just looks like a crawdad. And so I started catching fish and I had like 15 pounds my first afternoon of practice um, running rock veins around the ramp. And I'm like, OK, so there's plenty of fish to live here. And then it just kept progressing from learning the dam area and trying to figure that out and not really doing great down there by the dam the first three days of practice um, but then figuring out Longtown or the first two days of practice I didn't do great down by the dam but then I figured out Longtown on the fourth day of practice I found a bunch of brush piles in there that I didn't really catch that many on but I started to get a few bites on them and then the final day of practice was really the key to where I figured out okay this is what I'm going to do and this is I don't know. Like, it's weird. I didn't have my favorite technique fall into my lap until the last day of practice. 
And you hear that a lot too with guys who end up doing really well in tournaments is they don't figure they don't figure it out until later. And I've gone off on tangents about uh about you know you get focused in super early on one thing and then you're physically not able to recognize anything else that exists because oh, in yeah. your head okay. you're like I'm looking for this 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 and this and like this stuff doesn't exist in your brain and then afterwards you're like it was so freaking easy how did I not see it so it's kind of a blessing sometimes to not actually most of the time to not figure it out until that first morning of the tournament or the last day of practice are you on the same page with me on that yeah, absolutely. It was kind of a grind and it was different every day. Like I said, that first day of practice, I caught good keepers doing something on six to eight foot rock. And I was feeling good about that. I thought I was going to be able to catch like 13 pounds a day doing it and have a good finish. And then that was just like hit or miss. It was like I'd try it somewhere else or on a different day or a different time of day and I wouldn't get bit. And I, you know, so I just ended up figuring out what I like to do down by the dam um, on a deep brush pile on a point on the big sandy side, the porum side of the mm -hmm. lake down there. And I started finding those brush piles out there and I actually was getting fish to follow my bait. They were looking at my bait all the time and I could not catch them. And I'm like, what in the world? Like these gotta be bass, but there's so many trash fish. I would say trash, but you know, catfish and crappie and striper and white bass in Lake Eufaula. I had to weed through them and give them <laughs> something you know, that I could know that if it was in front of a bass, he was going to behave in a certain way and he was going to come up and at least I could get him to nibble it and eat it, you know, get a bite or two from a bass. And that's when I pulled out the Ned Meeky, I call it the little Z-Man streaks three, seven, five with the finesse size jig head. And I started getting bid in the last hour and a half of practice, which it's really just a miracle. It was really incredible how it worked, but I started getting bit on that thing in the last hour and a half of practice. And I caught a three and a half pounder off a tree. And that was what started cluing me in. And then I'm thinking about all the other brush piles I had already marked throughout practice and fished with a jig or with a hard head or a drop shot. And I hadn't had that many bites in them. Um, and it's like, okay, if I can do this, this is what I do back at home on the Coosa River is I'm really good at, I call it tickle winding is what I call it. And uh, so I was, I was tickle winding out there and uh, doing something that I love to do. And I've been doing it for three, you know, over three years now and catching bass doing it. And I've always known that someday it would set up where you can win a tournament doing it because it catches big ones, even though it's a three inch bait. It just catches big ones when you put it around them. You said it was like a miracle. Did you go into like what it what that aha moment was? I mean, you said so, you caught a three, but there had to be something that made you go, oh, my gosh, this is it. Yeah, yeah I finally pulled up and I like when you're live scoping and you're looking at a, just a plethora of fish everywhere, like there's a, there's hundreds of fish Anytime you drop your troll motor in the it's water. It's a dirty I'm screen is what I call it. it you yeah. follow as a very dirty live, so, live scope screen. There's always yep. something alive when you drop it. <laughs> it is. It's a dirty screen. And the clearer the water is, the less dirty it gets necessarily, typically. Um, the more sediment in the water and the more you're in like a river where the thermocline's mm -hmm. high, and everything's packed up high in the water column, it gets even dirtier. But um, down there by the bottom end of the lake, the aha moment was I caught two small keepers and then a three and a half pounder off a tree on the Ned Meeky doing what I love to do. And I saw that big one came off that tree. And I said, I told my buddy, uh, Matt Hodgkinson that I was practicing with, I said, do that. That one right there is big if he eats it. And I just, I kept teasing it away from him. He came right up and just swam like right through it. You know, he just continued on through it. And I set the hook and I was like, dude, that's a three plus like all day long. That's a three plus pounder. And it was a three and a half pounder. So I was fired up and then I started catching crappie and stuff mixed in and more white bass. But right at the end of the day, with like 30 minutes left, this was the miracle part. I graphed, I had fished a point on the on a, the side of a hump um, down there in that lower end of the lake. It's a big, mm -hmm. obvious hump that everyone sees. It's on the right-hand side as you're running down towards the dam. And I had fished that thing in practice and not had a bite on it. And I hadn't looked super deep on it. But I pulled up and I fished the stumps that were on top of it, some big stumps and a big tree thing. And I throw at it and I catch a keeper and I kept trolling out and I had like literally 30 minutes before we had to be off the water. And I see like a dotted up line of fish going out off the side of that drop out in from 16 to 22. Wow. And I'm like, man, some of those look like bass. Like I just knew it right away. I was like, those look like bass. So I throw out there with a Ned Meeky and a three pounder comes up and smokes it. And that was the one I posted on my Instagram that had the black spots on it. And I said, I might yeah. just come out and that's 30 minutes left and I catch a bass and I'm like, okay. So there's bass mixed in with this school. I catch like 20 white bass in a row after that. Never caught another bass there in practice. And that's the miracle part. Like the odds of pulling up on that point, there ended up being thousands of white bass there. So the odds of pulling up on that point and catching a bass out of that school of white bass on your first cast in it was not very good. 
but it told me that hey a lot of people might overlook this because there's so many white bass you could hard you could fish it all day long and not get a bass bite but i caught a bass and i knew there was bass in there and i figured they'd be better quality so i wanted to also incorporate that into my game plan to spend some time there late in the day and hopefully catch a few key fish off that and i i realize now in tournaments you only need 10 fish you know you're looking for 10 bites it's not that many fish and i've been enjoyed recently it's the little clues in practice that you don't even think about when it happens like you might find a brush pile that you don't get a bite on in practice but it looks good it's the right kind of thing just because they weren't there that day doesn't mean you shouldn't go back and check it in the tournament and fish loose and adjust and so it's those little keys you don't even realize that end up playing a big factor in a good tournament is that when you hear guys say i'm fishing really good right now or i'm fishing really well right now it's not necessarily that they're landing on the biggest fish and catching a ton but is it in your opinion that they're identifying realizing and then expanding on those little keys that when you're not fishing well just kind of go like kramer style out of your mind and you don't even think about it again but like when you're fishing well you realize that something important just happened even if it's something small yeah absolutely it's it's fishing relaxed and then like i said fishing smart not having a hundred different ways i wanted to go and wasting time but then having, like you said, those little clues that just mm -hmm. key you in. And I'm, I stay calm and I stay positive. And I know that I'm at a Bassmaster Open for a much bigger reason than just fishing. Um, and I know what God designed me to do, and that's to share the gospel. And that's so that's what I do is I'm as I'm traveling. Fishing is my ministry, and God blessed me with a talent to fish and a love for it. And I'm obviously I've done it since I was a baby. Like I've been obsessed with fishing since I was a baby. And I've always been good at it. Like I've, I've always just got the bites and excelled and understood fish. But it's like when you find that peace and that relaxation and that comfort and knowing that my plan is never going to work, but God's plan is perfect. And I don't have to worry about the details of he's going to provide for my family. He's going to provide for my children. I've got three sons, as most people know, and a wife. And I just I don't have to think about the details. So the pressure comes off of me. Um, I'm not thinking about making the Elite Series. If I'm meant to be on the Elite Series, you better believe I'm going to catch them good enough to be there. If I'm not meant to be on the Elite Series, I'm going to keep fishing the Opens, which I love doing, and I make a living fishing. So I'm very blessed in that aspect uh, to get to do it. So the pressure's gone, and when the pressure's gone, you can fish clean, and you can have you can pick up on the little keys and just enjoy yourself and do what you're good at doing. And we're all good fishermen. I know you're mm -hmm. a great fisherman, too. And yeah. you know what it feels like to be relaxed, be <laughs> comfortable, and to go catch them. So it is uh i will say that you you are very talented with the uh message that you deliver in the mornings uh before the takeoff you have a little uh a little message that you say and then you give an opening prayer uh very well spoken very uh direct to the point uh appreciate that i know a lot of the other right. anglers do uh That's so thank you very much perfect. for that thank you uh, I can also tell how small the body of water is going to fish based on your morning prayer, based on whether you ask for uh, patience and getting along with the other anglers <laughs> during, <laughs> during the prayer or whether it's spread out and you pray, pray for yeah. safety and good decision making. But it is funny yep. at some of them. You're like, you know, hey, we're we're asking for patience and understanding as we fish yep. around 75 other anglers. today. Yeah. I know there could be a fight out there today, so let's let's just show some brotherly love and not kill yeah. each other. Uh, <laughs> speaking of which, right outside that ramp, that release area is no secret that there's been a, literally a billion fish caught over there over the past years. That's why that whole cove is off limits. It's a big cove. It's a long, it's a six minute idle out there to get out there. Yeah. Uh, on day two, I was boat 109, and there were I literally pulled over and drove 40 miles an hour and counted, and there were 37 boats that had started wow. on that on that less than a mile long stretch. I'd heard there were over 50 that ended up starting there i don't know what boat you were on day two but uh i i know some of your fish came off of that when there were only 10 boats left on it and you talked about how you started by catching them on it did you ever get in that mix and figure out because i know i think the day one leader couple guys were on that stretch as well i it was amazing to me how much that community hole played throughout the tournament with as many anglers and co-anglers were all plucking fish so this is amazing. That place is where I, that stretch is where I started catching them on day one of practice and across the lake on some different veins. Mm -hmm. But I've tried, I started there. I was boat three on day one of the tournament and I caught one like barely 14 inch or like didn't even hardly touch the line. And I was like, okay, this is, you know, and I ran, I fished it pretty hard and I was trying to fish slow on the rocks. I was throwing a chatterbait too in a top water and not getting bit. And I'm like, why did these fish leave the rocks? I just didn't quite understand it. 
come to find out that, and so I left and I had two keepers at 10 o'clock on day one of the tournament when I started going offshore and then landed on the 14 and a half pounds by just plucking things apart. But I didn't get bit there hardly in the morning. And I found out on the last day of the tournament, since I came back in there and there weren't too many people there on the final day, um, I was, it was like just the last second Hail Mary. I'm just going to pull up. I know they live here. I got 30 minutes left. I'm going to go throw my Ned rig in the afternoon on the rocks, just like I did on the first day of practice. I've tried it in the morning all over the place and I can't get bit that good. So maybe in the afternoon, it's just an afternoon deal. And I pulled up there and caught two, three and a halfs with less than 30 minutes left, like within 10 minutes. And that was the win, wasn't it? Yes. That was the win right there. Which were you crazy. like hooting and hollering? Were you pumped? Were you, did you have like some Zen calm? Like, what was that like? Cause I mean, dude, you won the Bassmaster Open. You go to the Bassmaster Classic. You knew that that had to give you a good shot to get the W in it. Like that, there's not too many guys who experience a last second major win for 50 plus K, 10 K in another classic berth. Yeah. There, I was very calm about it because I pulled up there with 12 pounds and I knew that probably wasn't going to get it done, especially with Trey McKinney fishing yeah. behind us. I'm like, that kid's going to catch him again. There's no doubt. And so when I pulled up there, I just, I did have a calmness about me. And I said, I was praying and I said, if, if I'm meant to win this, which things had lined up in that direction, but I don't know if I'm meant to struggle and have zero fish on the final day, that's fine. But I already had 12 pounds. So I'm grateful for what I have. Cause if you could have guaranteed me 12 pounds a day, on Lake you fall for the open, I would have taken it and got a check and got out of there. Mm -hmm. So I got 12 pounds again and I have a four and a half pounder and I had a pound and a halfer and a 180 and then another two pounder. And so I'm like, man, I got to, you know, I would love to catch another big one and I've got a lot of room to cull. And I just, my confidence level was like down the tube in my mm -hmm. physical ability to catch a bass on that spot mm -hmm. with how many boats had fished it. But I was, I just prayed and I said, God, if I'm meant to catch one here, I guess it's going to have to have to happen right here. Cause this is the only way I'm going to catch one. Cause I'm not running all over for the last 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of stink in the last 30 minutes of competition. A lot of the time I get scattered and I start fishing too fast. So I just set the boat down and I start throwing that Ned rig and just popping rocks with it and twitching it and snapping it. And one swims off with it. And it was like, it was a keeper, like a two pounder. And I lost him. And I'm like, dang, that was weird. I actually had a bite and I throw out there again and catch another keeper, but it didn't help. It was a 140. And then I fished five more minutes down those rocks and I set the hook and this one's just head shaking like crazy. And it was all skinny and long and beat up. And I felt very calm about it, but I'm like, are you serious? Did I really just catch a three and a half pounder? And I bring it by the boat and scoop it. And I'm like, okay, I got like, you know, about 15 pounds. Mm -hmm. That's going to make it really close. Um, probably is what I'm thinking. And my marshal, my poor marshal's just sweating back there. Like he's got, you know, he just can't <laughs> try not to show any emotion. Like he was, he up. knows you don't know. Yeah, he knows. I don't know. And we became really good friends. And I th he knew how close I was all day. And I talked through mentally where my mind is and where my heart is throughout the day with him. And, you know, he just has to keep agreeing, you know, just shaking yeah. his head, laughing or whatever. So I'm like, OK, that just happened. Like, what are the odds of that happening to catch a true good one there, like a 20 inch long one? And then I'm like, you know, if this meant to happen, I guess it's just going to have to happen. Like, I guess we'll just close it out right here if it's meant to happen. And I literally threw like five more casts and got another three and a half. And I'm like, <laughs> I set the hook on it and it's just like, you know, when they're sick, when they're tired and they've been yeah. released, like they're just like slow head shaking. Yeah. And I'm like, kidding me? Like sawing through the water. That fish is down there going, are you kidding me? I ate another lure. Yeah. I just <laughs> ate another lure that I thought was a crawdad. And he came up and like, they would jump, but they couldn't fight after they jumped. It wasn't like athletic Toledo mm -hmm. Ben jump. It's like a jump and a land and a flop and just lay You got me. Walk. Yeah, like, and so he did jump, though. They would flop like crazy. They just wouldn't fight. So I just kept leading his head around and grabbed him. And I looked at my marshal, and I'm like, did that really just happen? And if wow. I wasn't a believer, I wouldn't have believed it. Um, if I, I, it's just, I don't believe in luck at all. That just, that kind of stuff just doesn't happen. I mean, the whole week was like that. Even the second day, if you want me to go into that, it was like that, too. And it was meant to be. Yeah, we'll take a break, and when we come back, we'll get into it. I do want to show, and then I also wanted to get a little bit into this deal because you're kicking everybody's butt with it. That's that's it right there, isn't it? Streaks is 3.5? Streaks 3.5? Uh, it's 3.75. That's 3.75, but that's what it looks yeah. like? Yeah, it's a Streaks 3.75. They also have the Senate Jerk Shads line, which is what Gussie won the Classic on with the 4-inch Senate okay. Jerk But and wait, then, this is the Streaks Z 3.75. Yep. That's what you're Ned Meekian. Yes, sir. What color is your, your go-to? Um, I use Shiner, and I use Smelt, and I use Smoky Shad. Okay. Those, 
ones. Shiners, I mean, Chad. This is, and I this caught is, all my fish on Shiner this week. Which one's Shiner? Or twelve of the twelve of the fifteen I weighed in were on Shiner. There you go. Yep. Right there. Well, it doesn't look as shaddy. It just looks like a bait fish. It just looks good, you know. Okay. Uh, day two is when you had a twenty-two pound sack. Yes, sir. That was Primar a primarily on that. Every single one of them. On Every that. single one. All right, we're going to take our first break of the show, and when we come back, yeah. we'll dive. We'll dive into that, and then I also want to get into this technique, uh, in a roundabout way. Not in a roundabout way, in an exact way. We've seen classics one on it now. We just saw a BPT one on something very similar to this. Uh, the first time. I mean, this is basically a. You're calling it a Ned Meeky, but this is a Demeeky rig that is a East Tennessee primarily developed technique for cold water fish that are lethargic and we're seeing tournaments won all over the country 12 months out of the year big sacks finesse baits non-traditional fisheries is this where we're headed for the next five years of 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 bass fishing think about that question joey because you're one of the guys that's making this thing kind of pop off uh, and we'll talk about that. We're back live in studio. It's a Monday, uh, June 19th, June 19th, the day after Father's Day. Hopefully everyone had a good Father's Day. It's BTL and we will be back with two-time Bassmaster Open champion Joey Nania right after this. The new Puma STS has been redesigned from the ground up. With the angler design function and performance in mind, nothing on this new offering was compromised and the only thing carried over from the previous version is the name. Based on the soft touch series hull that started with the flagship Jaguar, this new model is nimble and performs incredibly well at all speeds with either a 250 or 300 horsepower engine. Featuring a new 96 inch wide body footprint, this hull measures out at 20 foot 7 inches in length. Industry leading design coupled with tournament winning performance. The Puma STS from Basscat. Feel the rush. Eating kind of man. And on behalf of all of those bigger, I gotta say it once and for all, it's bad enough that the fish look smaller in our hands. The last thing we should have to worry about is getting quality outdoor clothing that fits. Avco, any fish, any water. Elite Series Pro Daryl Gleason here. My Pro Guide batteries keep me going on those long tournament days and long practice days. Always plenty of juice, never fail. The best part about Pro Guide batteries, it's the people behind the company. They have over 40 years experience in the battery business, keeping all of us fishermen out on the water longer, catching more fish. Check them out at ProGuideBatteries.com. What's up, Bass Talk Live fans? Brandon Polinick here. And ever since I won a couple Bassmaster Elite Series events on X-Zone Lures, I've been getting a bunch of questions of what makes them so special and different. And really, the truth is, it's in the details. The little details, things like no cheap fillers in their plastic, that gives you more lifelike action, more realistic and vibrant colors. But don't just take my word for it. Go to www.xzonelures.com and check them out for yourself. All right, welcome back. Joey Nania talking all things Lake Eufaula, Oklahoma. I'm going to call my buddy Justin Phillips out. He kind of called himself out a little bit in the comments uh, leading into this. Like I did the Bassmaster preview for it, and I felt a little awkward because they should have been doing it with Justin Phillips because he's kind of the, right now, he's the king of Lake Eufaula. I mean, it's true. He's, he's humble. He'll tell you he's not, but he's really good at it. And, uh, you know, he did, he did a lot of work going into this one. And I talked to Justin, here he is. He said, uh, hats off to you, man. I thought you were crazy catching sand bass. Congratulations. So on that day too, he said he <laughs> drives by and I said, I saw the same, said the same thing to you too. Didn't I going into day two? I was like, dude, I see you like, you're out there in the freaking ethos doing your little shaky thing. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> crap, Joe's going to catch him. But Justin said he turns to his co angler and he goes, look at that idiot. Out in the middle of nowhere, live scoping white bass. 
He oh. said that you came in with the monster sack and he's like, guess I'm the idiot today because he only had 10 and a half pounds. But, uh, but uh, I mean, dude, you were going through, I mean, to explain the white bass to people like acres would just explode and they were anywhere from seven inches to two pounders. They were, there's so many white bass in it yes. and it was unbelievable that you were able to figure out how to catch the bass through those white bass using that streaks 3.75. Yeah, that was that was nuts. And like I said, that one little clue on the final day of practice, catching a three pound bass out of a school of white bass was cool. And that's what got me set in the right direction. Now, I told some people this uh, already, but there was I wasn't catching them out of the ones that were suspended in schooling. So those were not the white bass I was targeting. Mm -hmm. These had to be like white bass that were glued to the bottom on a true like Tennessee. It looked like a Tennessee River school, but it was ninety nine percent white bass and one percent bass. Um, and I just was very fortunate to figure out that there was a 1% of bass and that the 1% of bass that were in there were big. Were if they you, eating the white bass? I don't know. I don't think so, but maybe, I mean, they were whales <laughs> for real. They were big. <laughs> like they weren't, they weren't very small ones when you got bit out there. Um, and on day one of the tournament, I pulled up there with an hour left and caught one, almost four. And then I saw, actually, I just watched the new avatar movie with my kids the night before. <laughs> And I, I was looking at these teeny, like, I mean, literally thousands of white bass dotted up the bottom. Looks like a school of bass, but they're tiny. And I was like, this looks, I told my co I said, dude, it looks like there's a pack of avatars walking through the white bass down there. And it was like a wolf pack of five big ones just coming right down the ridge line towards me over through the white bass, like right over the top of them. And I'm like, that's wild. And I flew and it, it, you know, it takes five seconds to get there. And I intersected them perfect as they were swimming. And one came up and I pulled it away from them and they just came up and smoked it. And that was a four pounder also. So I caught two fours there and a two and three quarter on day one. Day two, I pulled up there. At, I had a long day. So it was like 3.30 in the afternoon on day two. And I've got it. On, I'll have this on my YouTube page when I post these videos. Um, I'm here in the north woods of Wisconsin. So I'll, I'll get to the editing yeah, it's part. It's a great looking log cabin behind you, by the way. Thank you, man. It's raining. It's peaceful. It's so nice, man. It's like 65 degrees. Wow. But um, so I... I pulled up in those white bass and I threw out there and I wanted to let as many white bass bump it without hooking one as possible. So I threw in there out onto the point in 22, the boat was in 22, I was thrown in like 19. And I mean, I'm talking about, I just sat there and let it machine gun. It was like, boom, 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 boom. And I'd let it fall down through them and they'd be just tapping it like crazy. And I would try not to hook them. I would try to shake them off and let the bait get underneath them. And the bait got underneath them on my first cast when I got there on the second day. And it just locked up. It got heavy. And I, you know, white bass don't just get heavy. And so I set the hook and it was a 465. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I just, you know, I'm, I just had a great day. All of a sudden I just went from having a mediocre day to a really solid day. And I, you know, fixed my bait up, call, throw back out there. And I'm, I'm working through them for like probably a minute or two over, over a minute. On one cast. A white, yeah. One cast. And I'm like, yes, I haven't hooked any white bass. And it goes, don't, and just holds it. And I set the hook and it was a 648 on my scale. Nine. <laughs> and I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. I just got 22 pounds. <laughs> like what in the world just happened? And I had already found new brush piles that day and mm -hmm. caught some apps off of them. And so I was like, dang, that just like things just got really, really wild, really quick. So it was just, it was wild, man. And I never caught another bass there the entire rest of the tournament. Even on the final day, I never caught another bass on that spot. Justin requests that you don't show maps or waypoints in your YouTube videos. <laughs> nope. I'm not that technical. I edit my own stuff. And so you guys know that it's not professional editing quality, but it's good to watch and it's real. So, all right. Uh, this bait, like I said before the break, is this where we're headed in bass fishing? We've seen, uh, we've seen like the fuzzy dice winning stuff. We're seeing a lot of real natural. We're seeing Nico rigging. We're seeing guys in non-traditional ways using finesse along with forward facing sonar to completely break the mold of how tournaments should be won, how big fish should be caught based on what we've read in Bassmaster for years. Uh, like I said, you're one of the guys who's figured this out and is taking advantage of it. What are your thoughts on this? Is this, is this thing here to stay? And if you're going to be competitive at top level tournaments moving forward, are you going to have to get good at this stuff? I don't think you have to do it. Um, a lot of guys still caught him on a drop shot. A lot of guys still caught him on a shaky head. A lot of guys caught him on a Nico. Um, and they and they did really good. Um, it doesn't always set up where you can win it doing using what I call the Ned Mickey or the Mickey style. Um, it just doesn't. And so I think you need to be good at it, though. 
And you need to be versatile, though. I always say this if I'm speaking to a group of kids. Like, you got to be able to catch them traditional bass fishing ways. Not every tournament's going to set up where you can go scope them. Like, I never scoped a fish at Wheeler during the tournament. And I had a good finish there and was in the top 10 after day one. So, you want to know how to power fish. You got to be a really good caster. And I've practiced my pitching so much in my life. Like, I can, I'm very, very efficient with left hand pitching and being super quick. So, if I got to pick something apart, I'm good at it. And skipping and doing all those mm -hmm. things so important you don't want to lose that aspect of the sport and i don't want to see kids that are only good at live scope you know <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, yeah you got to be versatile and that's one of the biggest keys and so if i can have a flipping pattern and i'm comfortable doing that i can have my live scope deal um i can have some you know a bunch of different options that's what makes you good at tournament fishing is rolling through that stuff but that being said i've weighed in at Wheeler, I only weighed in one fish on it, but Toledo Bend, I weighed in eight out of my 10 and I finished 12th place on a Ned Meeky. Um, at and, and that was oh. one on a big soft swim bait, a glide bait, and a Carolina rig on 25 pound test. And you were out there with the spinning rod yep. and, and almost made the final day. Yeah. Yep. I caught a 675 on a Ned Meeky on the, on the second day of the turn or the first day of the tournament. Yep. And it was in five feet of water cruising on a rock shelf. And I pitched at it like five times and finally teased over its head perfect and it slurped it. So it's crazy stuff. It really is. Um, but it's a technique that you should learn. And crappie fishing helps. A lot of guys have heard that before. Um, but it's just, it's like crappie fishing for bass. Like I literally caught 30 crappie a day, 30 to 50 white bass a day, and 20 bass a day, all three days of the tournament, pretty much. It's one of the best crappie lakes in the country. Not for yeah. size as far as like two and a half, three pounders, but yeah. as far as 12 to 14 inch crappie. And we can keep 37 in Oklahoma a piece. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of crappie in that lake. Yeah, there are. And it works good. I caught so much crappie. Like it was nauseating <laughs> crappie I'd have to catch. My hands are so cut up. Like I've got cuts and stab marks from all the white bass <laughs> and the crappie and stuff. Like it was hard. Yeah. All of kind of like it exhausted me. That lake did. I'd catch a fish there one day. And if I went back to that same pile, other than that one deep school two days mm -hmm. in a row, I wouldn't get bit on the pile I caught them on. I'd get bit on the next one over. Or the one I didn't get bit on the day before, I'd get bit on the next. And it was like that every single day. Is that a pressure deal? I don't know. I think they just swim a lot. I don't think okay. they live on the piles. Like, I would be fishing a pile and fishing it, and I'd catch crappie, crappie, crappie. And I can see if there's, a, you know, normally if there's a bass in there, except for all the fuzz of bait that was around mm -hmm. it. And all of a sudden, a bass would swim through it. Like, they'd come from another direction and come into it. And my bait, I would just hit them when they would come to it. And then I'd call out a big bass, you know, uh, stuff like that. Just, I think they just swim a lot. They just coast around. What you're talking about is high level live scoping. You're not talking about, you know, if you have ever read a message board, which I wouldn't really recommend doing, no, but I if don't. you have, it's the whole, oh, he's got live scope. We're seeing it on every single tournament. What you're talking about is you are you are simplifying very high-level live scoping. You're talking about the boat moving in one direction, looking at, and you don't have like a 16-inch screen on your boat, do you? No, I have 110 at the dash and 110 on the front. There you go. You're looking at motion one way, then you have the vertical motion of the pendulum of the bait in deeper water plus the movement of the fish. And what you're doing is intersecting with all of those moving parts, a three and a half inch bait on a light jig head, two boat links underneath the boat, except out like folks go try to do that. What, what I don't think people understand is how much time and effort it takes to get that good at it. You guide a lot. You do this a lot guiding you fish in your fun time. You do it all. This is not a show up with live scope in this bait and win as Gussie proved too. There's a lot to it, you know, at the classic with as many guys as we're trying that, but it's really high level stuff that there's not many guys in the world can do it to that level. I yeah, mean, that's the hard. truth. That's the truth. Like, I'm just saying that to the listeners, like what you just described is really hard to do and I'm freaking good at it. And it still frustrates me. Yeah. And I have to coach people when I guide, I like, that's the hard thing about guiding with live scope, but it's made me better. I, I actually have to get somebody else to do it. Like it's one thing for me to do it, but to say, okay, you need to throw right there. Let it sink. Let it sink. Let it sink. Stop. Like hover, 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 wine, 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 like all that stuff. It's really, it's hard. And if they miss, like they miss by three feet. You just totally missed. Like you said, a swimming fish, a moving boat, a sinking bait. All the timing has to be perfect. And I was told a long time ago that guiding is the worst thing you can do as a tournament angler. It'll mess you up. It changes the way you fish. 
But with the way technology is going now, time on the water accelerates your learning as far as seeing that many fish react to lures. Um, and that's where I think guiding at this point now has really helped me to be on the water a ton. When I'm home, I make a living guiding and I'm not going to just quit guiding because I won a tournament and I have, you know, got a, a nice check. Like I'm going to keep on working hard and providing for my family and keep fishing. And I look at every guide trip day as an opportunity to invest into someone's life. I get to go spend a day on the water with somebody and get to know them and love on them. You know, it's just, it's a cool opportunity and I, I love guiding and it's helped me to see more fish react to lures. If people want to get on the water with you, you got any days left this year? Yeah, I've got a bunch in August and quite a few in September. And, uh, well, you know, just all around the tournament. Like, I, I guide year-round around our okay. tournament. Uh, website yeah. to go to to get in yeah. touch with you? Yeah, joeyfishing.com, and I've got a contact request form. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I really I want to thank everyone that's given me, sent me messages and stuff and, and texts and messages on social media and comments. It's incredible the amount of love and the amount of encouragement that that brings me. I mean, it really is. It just, it makes me want to keep pressing forward for the right cause and not pressing forward just for fishing or to glorify myself, but pressing forward to glorify God and to make a difference in the world that actually matters. These trophies are going to, I'm not going to take these with me to the grave, you know, they're going to be ashes and dust someday. And so I know what, what I can take with me and that's a relationship with Jesus and knowing where I'm going in eternity. So that's good stuff. Uh, all right. I, I do want to get one more segment in with you because this points okay. race is bonkers. Like yes, you would think that you would be like in the top four. I know you're not worried about it. I know it's going to take care of itself. You'll finish where you finish. Heck, you finished like one point out a couple years ago and took it like a champ, right? <laughs> yeah, it's <was> all good. <laughs> <laughs> but it's absolutely insane what a handful of these dudes are doing with 170 of them fish in every tournament. And I way underestimated what it was going to take. I think I know there's four left. I don't want to, I think the phrase that I heard someone say is jump the shark. I don't want to jump the, is it? Or put the jump cart. The shark. I, I isn't that uh, might be jump ship. I don't know. I don't know. Or put the cart, the cart in front of the horse. That one yeah, would work there too. Cart in front of the horse. That's very important. Right. But dude, right I d there's way. like 15 guys that I don't see them not catching them in the final four. And you're and one of those awesome. guys. So we'll take one more quick break. And then we'll come back and we'll wrap things up uh, with Joey and Ania. And then I also have some stuff that I want to get to in the last segment. The studio is coming together. I was on the water practicing one day. See that right there? Mm -hmm. So for the last uh, for the last like month, I've been trying to get the, the other wall of my studio. I mean, it's finished, but I wanted some meaningful jerseys. So I got like Frank Scalish. We do a day four show with him every every week. So I wanted a Frank Ski gave me the jersey at the Classic. Uh, I want a Brad Hallman jersey because he's been a big part of BTL over the years. And then Charlie Hartley's the guest host. I have him on. He's like the most positive, epic guy ever. And he's on the show all the time. So I wanted a, a Frank Scalish, a Charlie Hartley, and a Brad Hallman jersey. So I tell Charlie, I said, hey, throw it in the boat. He's like, got it, done. Well, I didn't see him the last two tournaments. So I'm in Longtown practicing. And I see this guy and he doesn't have a wrapped boat and he's got the buff over his head. And all of a sudden he like day three of the classic hook sets and he's like <laughs> fighting this thing. Well, I'm like on one side of this dock row and he's on the other and I'm telling my co-angler Darren, I'm like, look at this idiot. This guy just absolutely wailed on a fish and now he's fighting it like it's day three of the classic. He like runs around the boat. He lands it. He's all over the place. And then he like, runs throws his troller motor up jumps down and he starts idling around towards me and i'm like what the hell is going on with it well i realized that it's charlie hartley in his new ranger it's an unwrapped boat he realized it was me he was jacking with me on the hook set and he gave me the jersey <laughs> so i finally I, got a hold of him yeah he's hilarious man i saw him skateboard ramp the other day at a dock at, at yeah, one and he still does it is yeah. is phenomenal so he's awesome yeah, I got that. I also uh, I also want to get into an email. I'll do that right before the break now, because I think you'd find this interesting that Josh S. sent me. And uh, this is an interesting email I got yesterday. He said, my wife's uncle and an other and another gentleman are doing a fundraising event and awareness for stopping soldier suicide. Frank, my wife's uncle, 78 years old, is attempting to paddle in a canoe the entire length of the Mississippi while another vet who lost his son to suicide last year is driving the support vehicle and doing all the logistical coordination. That sounds like an epic adventure, doesn't it? 
Yes, it does. I this is part- where VTL viewers can get involved in this. He said they just wrapped up day 15, 450 miles and still a long way to go. They've gotten a lot of help so far in Minnesota, but will soon depart home and won't have the same level of help they had while they were in Minnesota. He said, I know this is a big ask, but I was hoping you could bring awareness to this cause on the show and see if we have any listeners along the Mississippi in Iowa, Missouri, Arkansas, Mississippi and Louisiana who would like to volunteer a day or even half a day paddling with Frank in his canoe as he makes his way down the river. Then Josh said, I spent time with him yesterday getting just shy of 23 miles near my home and even half a day of help would be amazing. There's a Facebook page that you can follow it. Uh, And then if you are interested in this, like I said, if you want to jump in and paddle uh, Mississippi river along the Mississippi in Iowa, Missouri, Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana, uh, shoot me an email, Matt, M-A-T-T, at BassZone.com, and I will pass this along to Josh, and then he will get in contact if you have any uh, if you have any interest in getting involved with that. So I thought that was a cool email that uh, that might make for some lifelong stories, a good cause, and burn a few calories. I didn't know you could lock in a canoe. Yeah, I think they're taking <laughs> out, and then his okay. support vehicle is putting it the canoe back in after they get around the lock, yeah. I, was, uh, I would imagine that would have to be the only way they're doing it. <laughs> yep. I would agree. Portaging around the locks. Yeah. A canoe and a lock is a little sketchy. Locks in general are pretty sketchy. I like agree. if you think about it, have mm-hmm. you done the Arkansas river lock going oh, into yeah. Kerr with 170 yep. boats? Yeah. I've been up the Verdigris and up into yeah. the, Ver- in the, the Kerr. It's one. as close as we'll ever get to a shotgun start, isn't it? Yeah, oh, yeah. It's wild. All right, Joe and Ania, Let's when we come back, we'll talk about the race, and then we'll let you get back to vacationing with the trophy, the family, and the kids up in Wisconsin before trekking to New York to continue the Elite Series quest. BTL on a Monday. We'll be back right after this. The great thing about the new Sensation Soft Plastics from Big Bite Baits, heavily scented, super soft, buoyant, comes in seven great new shapes. I've got a couple of them of my signature series, the Cliffhanger Worm, and the ram tail craw, great for a flipping jig, football jig, swim jig, all that. Several other great shapes. Really excited about it. We've worked over the last year, catches fish all over the country, and I think it's going to catch fish for people everywhere you try it. The Spro Little John crankbait has been around for almost 15 years, and it is one of my go-to crankbaits whenever I need a fish in the boat. So you can never have enough new colors. That's why Spro is coming out with a handful of new colors, including Pearl Shad, which has this bleached out white look, but it's got this pearlescent, really, really pretty. We've got Copper Shad, which looks amazing in the water. It's got that purple flake on the back, really, really pops in the water. And then if you want some real pop, we've got Sparkle Shad, nothing but sparkles all over this thing. And then last but not least, we've got the matte sexy shad just a really different looking color for a crankbait so you want to give them a little different look that matte sexy shad is definitely the one to go with all these colors are available in the original little john and the md are you looking to install your own fishing electronics the solution is the bass tank power harness It takes the guesswork out of installation. No more voltage issues or interference. Designed by an engineer so that you can get professional results right there in your own garage. Installation done right with the help of the Bass Tank Power Harness. You can feel confident knowing that your installation was done right. The Bass Tank Power Harness. Give us a call or order yours today at thebasstank.com. Get the best patterns backed by tournament data. Start by finding the best 10% of your lake. Know exactly what to look for and what to throw. After that, you just put them in the boat. Try the deep dive app today. Look at that beast right there. Shoreline Boat and RV. Dock rash, storm damage, collision repair. That deep scratch or gouge from trying to access that secret creek. Shoreline Boat and RV can get your prize possession back in mint condition and looking good on the water. Fast. All repairs are done in-house, so they're able to get your boat or RV back to brand new, quickly. All Shoreline's work comes with a rock-solid warranty. Find out more at ShorelineBoatAndRV.com. Kansas City, Austin, and Tulsa. 
All right. Welcome back, BTL, on a Monday. I also want to let everybody know I was showing where that uh, Z-Man was on the Omnia uh, fishing website before. Currently, 25% off of the original Z-Man Finesse TRDs on OmniaFishing.com right now, which puts them to $2.99 a pack, which is a pretty, pretty solid get there for the TRDs. I've got some though, and then I accidentally squished them. So they're like, uh, they're flat TRDs and I'm going to try to make that a thing. Yeah. The flat turn. (laughs) You know what I mean though? How you'll get a pack that's like squished and you're like, well, they're still straight. Maybe it gives off a different signature in the water. (laughs) Right. It's like when my baby poops when he's in the car seat. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's talk about the uh, let's talk about the race here in the open standings. We're over halfway through the year now. Five tournaments in, things are starting to shake out of who is a contender and who is a uh, pretender. Uh, John Garrett, Trey McKinney. Did you get to know Trey McKinney at all? I think he's a dude from Illinois. He's 18 years old. He's he's been around the high school scene and he's absolutely killing it. I know you uh, that he he basically caught a last minute fish to beat him out of an open win this past week. Did you get a chance to talk with him? What are your thoughts on Trey? Yeah, I got to talk to him a lot, and I'm I'm in, I'm really excited about him and encouraged by just his mental aspect of the game and where his heart is and doing this. And I just anytime I see somebody succeed that's young, I just I know how quickly you can start to identify with success and how quickly you can get a little bit arrogant. And I'm not saying Trey is at all. He doesn't seem to be at all. He seems very humble, and he knows that his time will come if it's meant to happen. And I can I know he knows God, and that's important, but. Trey's an awesome kid, and I, I I enjoyed getting to talk to him. He was a little bit uh he was a little bit secretive of like what he had. He's like I I'm, I might have I might have four, fifteen you know I'm, I might I yeah. don't know skills weighing I don't know if skills weighing heavy I don't know what I got and I'm like so you got like sixteen seventeen don't you and I I can because I can read that on people yeah. I was laughing he thought was, he had I, it yeah I was like Trey why are you being so weird about it <laughs> and he's I, I I don't know and so it was pretty funny but he's a great kid and he has a great family I could tell just a good support system around him. And to be 18 and as good as he is, and I asked him, I was like, how do you get good in Illinois? Like, you live in Illinois. How are you so good at bass fishing? It's a great question. He said I get really good at scoping them. So It's a great question. Yeah, I grew up in Illinois. Yeah. Until I was 18. There's, Like I said, Swindle, when they went there for the All-Star event, said take care of the three bass that are in here. Yep. Uh, yep. Catches them every week. But then you've got the Iron Man, Kenta, who just, if there's a tournament, he's going to fish it and he's going to do well in it. Uh, JT uh, Tompkins, Keith Tuma, Matt Henry, uh, Robert G, Ben Milliken. You're in ninth. You're currently in. And then, like, you take a guy like Kyle Patrick, who's currently, what are they? Are they taking in nine? They're taking nine. Taking nine, yeah. So yeah. he's Kyle Patrick is the last man in right now. He's he's fighting for it right now. This is ridiculous because his finishes this year. This is two hundred and thirty boats to two hundred and eight boats. 170 EQ anglers that are in this 170. His finishes are 11th, 37th, 23rd, 13th, and 87th. That's freaking strong, folks, out of 200 plus boats. And he is fighting for the last place to qualify. He's in 10th. And here's the even sicker part he's like 100 points behind John Garrett. Yeah who I think we've all known is an elite series caliber angler and has been incredibly close over the last years. His finishes 30th, just a brutal finish in Oklahoma at 30th, yep. 30th, 23rd, 18th, fourth and fourth. And he's cracked over $40,000 in the opens Yep, this year. Has right. it shocked you how many guys have consistently finished in the, top 30 in this thing in a field that is just prone to landmines? Uh, yeah, it has. Honestly, I'm, I'm surprised it's, it's like that um, in a lot of ways, but there's so many guys in making that switch to nine. There was just, I think it was just kind of a perfect storm. I remember one year I missed it by a few points. Like this was a while back, like eight, six, seven, eight years ago or something. It was when Connell and Wheeler and Mark Daniels jr. And a bunch of those guys made the elites. Yep. And it was like this perfect storm of all these guys coming over to try to make the elites at the same time. And it was really, really hard to make it. And I had one of my best seasons ever then, but it wasn't time for me to make it. And uh, so this season is no different. I feel like there's these, and a lot of them are young guys. I mean, just incredible fishermen 
that really do understand every aspect and have poured their heart out into the sport. That's what they do is they fish and they spend a lot of time on the water and they're just really, really good at it. And so I'm surprised the average, like someone's got a bomb at some point, like there's going to be, <laughs> there's going to be a bad tournament mixed in normally. But I mean, I still think with four tournaments left and going to New York will be weird. I mean, you could catch 17 pounds a day and finish 90th possibly. Um, I think Watts bar, I've heard that place is awful this time of year. And that's mm -hmm. the one I like put a check mark on. Like I'm looking forward to that one. Yeah. It's gonna be tough and I can try to do my thing, but you got a lot of, and then Lake of the Ozarks, not, not a ton of guys have been there, especially opens level guys. And then Florida, man, what a, you can pull up, you can have a great place and boats can really get on it. You know, it's going to be a boat race to get to stuff. So I, I think things will still shake up and the averages will play out a little bit. But so far, it's just nuts how good you've had to keep. One of the things that I was wrong about was uh, a consistent limit each day will keep you in the mix. I'm in 62nd. I'm not in the mix. I mean, I've weighed in a limit every single day. Wow. I'm actually six, uh, 16 straight open days in a row with a limit, That's which impressive. I'm really proud of. Yep. But if you look at it, it hasn't gotten me anywhere. Wow. So no longer is that kind of old school mentality of catch your five come in and everything else will take care of itself. Now you fall is a little bit of an anomaly. I weighed in the two smallest limits. I think in the history of you fall, I weighed in eight, five and eight, six, and that was purely an ego weigh in because I would have come in with zero or one because I had a flawed game plan. And I thought that I could, I could get six to eight bites a day in the muddy water power fishing. Well, after six hours on the first day, I was like, I got to catch something. So yeah. I went into a marina with a Nico rig and knew that I was fishing for eight to 10 pounds, caught eight. So then the second day I said, well, let's just get the eight out of the way. So mm -hmm. I went and got the eight out of the way and then spent the last six hours not catching anything. But, uh, you know, other than that, that 10 to 12 pound limit that seems to have carried you for the last number of years, statistically doesn't seem to do any good anymore. Do you think that's a, is that a forward facing sonar live scope deal where you've got a lot more guys who are able to put a lot more weight on the table, being less familiar with the fishery? I think 100%. I think, um, any of these tournaments, if you go to them without live scope, the weights would be cut way down. There might be one or two guys that really crack the code and catch them rather than 10 or 15 guys that crack the code and catch them. And it's just, I think the consistent, you're seeing consistency way farther down through the field because of it. Um, even if guys are not the greatest at it, but they're getting one or two extra good bites a day doing it. But then you got guys that are catching all five of their fish. And like, I've caught 75% of my fish. I've seen them eat the bait this year, at least. Um, I've caught them. I've wow. watched it. Um, so that's just, it's kind of crazy, but that's just how it is these days. And I mean, like I said, I still think things will go up and down and shift around. But the fishing is harder. Like, it's harder to go catch a bass than it's ever been. But everyone's catching better average weight. And it's yeah. like, you can't just go fish down the bank and go do things like you used to be able to do and go drag a Carolina rig around and compete at all, where you used to be able to do that. Or you can't go crank a lot of the time and just go catch them and catch them and do good. You got to be a little sneaky and have multiple ways to catch them and then know how to live scope. I mean, there's so many of these. Like, you look at it. Yeah. Brett Cannon. Logan Parks, Jamie Bruce, Kyle Austin, Sam George, Tyler Williams. He was leading it after day one. Casey Scanling, guiding guides on on uh, Lake of the Ozarks. Oh well, there Dale Hightower's in twenty second. He's old school. He'll he'll yeah. get the aluminum up there. Uh, yep. Upshaw, Bobby Lane in twenty fifth, uh, Niggemeyer in twenty eighth. But I mean, dude, that top twenty is young guys who spend their time on the water who target big fish using forward facing sonar. Yeah, it is true. It's uh, it, it's undeniable. Yeah, I hope the technology stops. Like we need to cut it off now. Like no more. No What's more. next? What's just, next? What's the next advancement? I think it's going to be uh, VR goggles. You just put on the VR goggles and you got your graph right in your eyes and you just you just fish like that. You don't even care where. You're and then going. it like vibrates when you get close to something that you might yeah. hit. Yeah, it's like a fancy car. You know, it just vibrates when you're. I know go. you're joking, but you're not joking. I mean, can you imagine just having it on your face and just throwing? Because I don't look where I cast. I blind, you know, I, I'm, yeah. I don't look at my bait land normally, but mm -hmm. you know, you could, you could do some VR goggles, but I really hope the technology, like I just, if you can't catch them now by putting in the time to learn it, it's like, 
you know, and not just catch them, but if you can't hit bass in the face now, you just haven't put enough time into it and haven't, <laughs> I haven't let your mind adjust to it. I feel. But okay. Think of flight simulators. There's guys who become pilots. They, they blow hundreds of hours on flight simulators. Yeah. Uh, now I don't know if there's enough people to make the, inv the investment worth it, but like you know this better than anybody if you could get a realistic simulation live scope you legitimately could become a better angler by not being on the water and by doing this because the skill is still in finding it obviously but once you find them one out of a hundred guys can actually catch them the way that you're catching them imagine if you while it's raining, while it's January, while it's while you're not able to be out there, if you could put in five hours a day on a on a scope simulator, think <laughs> of, just think about yeah. that because think about how realistic the simulation is. They're doing it with goalies and hockey now with goggles and where the shots are coming from. They're doing it with the with the flying. They're doing it in golf. They're doing it in all these other sports for hand eye for that. If you could get that realistic simulation, if you could make it feasible, yep, then you, you are, it's, it's like being I, a popping targets and yeah you're doing you get better wouldn't you yeah i think so i just i wish you wouldn't have said that because that's, that's too juicy <laughs> we don't need we, someone's gonna come out with that but i don't think here's the thing i don't think there's enough like i think we live in a bubble we think everybody has fifteen thousand dollars worth of electronics everybody wants to go live scope to catch five like yeah it's big but i don't know you know after you give it to the couple thousand guys that are obsessed with doing this in a high level tournament where it makes, is there enough to actually make money on it for a Garmin or a company of a gaming company, an EA sports to pair with it or some sort of virtual reality company. That's where you have to look at if the numbers make sense. I agree. Yeah. I don't know. That's, it is an interesting thought though. And you're, you're right on it's time on the water and you still have to understand how fish behave. Like you said, and you mm -hmm. got to, and, and if you can add that, if you already understood fish and now I can go to a point and I can figure out how the fish use that point and what they do on it within minutes where I used to have to imagine. And like when I look at a lake, I've always said, I don't see the water. I see every single contour that's under the lake. I can't help it. Like if I look at a lake anywhere, I see what's underneath it. And that's just how the mindset of a fisherman, you don't see what's above, you see what's below it. And so I don't know. You see it in a deeper way, but then when you put live scope in the water and you're like, man, all this stuff that I used to guess about and I knew this was here, but now I really know what's going on. It just, it changes. It may be impossible to answer. How would you have fished this tournament without live scope? What do you think you would have done if you didn't have any forward facing sonar? Oh man, I would have been looking for rock veins and dragging something on it and cranking the bank a lot more and you know, trying to just run patterns that I could just get bit running down the bank doing and then having off, you know, offshore stuff. And mm -hmm. I probably would have still graphed and found white bass on side imaging and down imaging. But yeah, you just, you wouldn't be able to pinpoint those fish and you'd be dragging. I would have thrown a shaky head in the brush piles. I got you. Think down to the bottom and drag it through them and touch everything I could or a Carolina rig or a hard head the whole time. Mm -hmm. Probably hard head in my hand, you know, that kind I, of stuff. I've covered every single tournament that's taken place in professional bass fishing since 2008 that's crazy. open toyota mlf bpt elite series everything this is the wild west right now joey yeah. like the last three years are the the craziest rule breaking like like breaking the rules of fishing like what uh -huh. is supposed to happen how it's supposed to happen the weights like historical data seasonal patterns are just getting trashed over the last three years and it's by guys that haven't done it before a lot of them you know like look at like a kyle hall like what's going on over there at yeah. mlf and stuff and we we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars look at a uh uh look at a uh, uh dakota e-bear yep i think michael neal's another one that got really good at it at the right time Yep. You know, and he yeah, he just catches them everywhere. He's so consistent because he knows what he's he knows what he's looking for. And listen, don't don't take that to say that they're less of anglers. They're just as impressive as when Kevin was doing it and Edwin and Skeet and those guys. Because I promise you, there were old school guys going, "Well, yeah, of course Kevin knows how to crank all those piles because he goes out and he freaking side images all that stuff." 
<laughs> and you know, back in my day, yep. I had to triangulate it. Yep, exactly. Or we just had a flasher to figure out where the hard bottom is. Now we can see you can see a you can scan a point in three passes now. Like how is that? It it's the same dang thing that's happening right now, yep. except on a different level. It's a it's a modern day gold rush for the guys that understand it. And yeah, you're definitely. you're right there. You're right there. You're understanding it, dude. You're taking advantage of it. Yeah, thank you, man. I'm I'm just doing my best and enjoying every second of it. So. All right, what do you got fishing? Just hanging out with the family? Like, what goes on at the cabin? Um, so I've got 32 family members here right now. My sister and my brother in law will be here in a couple hours, and uh, I've got all my aunts and uncles and cousins. And we've been coming to Hayward, Wisconsin, on the Spider Lake chain for over 70 years. My grandpa used to take his five sons, and now they've con- they've continued that on. And so my family owns a bunch of cabins down pick the way. Up. I'll pick you up. I'm in a we're renting this cabin from a friend, but it's just oh, wow. That- beautiful here in northern wisconsin and so it's just amazing man we've got all the family here we'll be fishing the main target is musky so i'm going to be musky fishing a bunch and getting some musky content and then just enjoying time with my my kids you know people think like oh since you fish for a living your sons get to fish all the time and zeke used to practice with me on the weekend before the off limits but now since mm-hmm. they did five day i can't fish with him out on the water and so it's just I, i'm excited to spend time just really investing into my kids and they loved, they were so happy for me when I won. Like they, Eli was sitting there praying in the parking lot, not praying for me to win, just praying for, you know, just the right things, praying in the right way for peace and comfort and contentment. Like, and he's a seven year old. Uh, so it's just, it's a blessing and I want to invest in them and I want to just go fishing with them. And it takes me a few days to unplug and then winning a tournament. It's really hard to unplug. Cause I, you know, you, there's so many things that come from it, but every opportunity is, I'm, you know, I know why this door open and I know why every door opens It's because God opens them. Well, enjoy the time with the family. Hopefully Thanks. you catch some big musky and it takes less than 10,000 casts. Yep. I, it will. I got life scope. Oh, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> and thank you for taking time out with all the family there and congratulations on your second win. And I'll see you in a couple of weeks up at, uh, up a thousand islands. Sounds great, man. Thanks. All right. See you, Joey. See you, buddy. All right. Joey Nania, like I said, check out uh, joeyfishing.com uh, to get on the water with him. Uh, and I feel like that'd be a very educational experience. I haven't actually been to the website. Let's see. We'll pull up the website and see what it looks like. Oh, yeah, there it is right there. Hold on a second. And there it is. He's, he's going to have to update that picture to the latest. Uh, but you can do guided trips, Coosa River System, Logan Martin, Neely Henry, Lay Lake, Mitchell, Jordan Lake, uh, and figure out what he does. Always, uh, always a good guest on BTL. I do want to mention if you are one of the four people that have won a uh, prize pack over the last uh, two and a half weeks on any of the live shows, I think we gave away uh, Spro. KGB collaboration, Chad Shad, some of the new X Zone uh, Stealth Invader, Drop Shot Baits, and a Denali Novus Pro Reel. Uh, I will be getting those in the mail today. Uh, so I will send you the, uh, the tracking numbers for that stuff. So looking forward to it. Looking forward to also doing some more uh, giveaways in the future back in town for the next uh, roughly two and a half weeks before we head up to the Kurt Dove Pro Bass Camp on Oneida Lake and looking to fill it out for the rest of the week. Like I said, there's a lot of stuff going on. Father's Day, I was fishing the tournament. So stay tuned to uh, BassZone.com for updates on the schedule for the remainder of the week. Uh, that kind of went over everything that went down with that with Joey. Good stuff. Uh, follow the rest of the uh, of the MLF. We'll get Matt Stefan on. I kind of want to leave him alone. He's like right in the mix to make the BPT. I don't want to really bug him about being fifth in the Angler of the Year until he actually makes it. And we'll have him on. We'll have a little celebration. I probably need to get a Matt Stefan jersey in here too. A little Bridgeford action. All right, this has been. Another edition of BTL. We'll talk to everybody tomorrow. See ya.